morning, everybody. Welcome to the LPTV TV Translator and FM Reimbursement Program webinar. Um, I'm Hillary DeNegro. I'm the Deputy Chair of the Incentive Auction Task Force here at the Commission. Um, I have a, a panel of FCC experts together with me in the room today. Uh, they include Jean Cadu, who is the Chair of our Incentive Auction Task Force, Jeff Newman, who is Chief Engineer of the Media Bureau in the FCC, uh, Hussein Hashimazada, who is the Chief of uh, Chief Engineer in the Video Division of the Media Bureau, uh, Tom Nessinger, who is an attorney in our Audio Division in the Media Bureau, and Dana Levitt, who's an attorney in our Video Division in uh, the Media Bureau. We also have some representatives from our uh, Fund Administrator here to help us answer questions later. Uh, the reimbursement program, um, how do you advance? Okay. The reimbursement program has been operating for over two years uh, for some categories of uh, stations. New funding from Congress allowed the Commission this month to expand the reimbursement program to include LPTV, TV translator, and FM stations. The purpose of this webinar is to provide an understanding of what you all should expect from the process including to introduce you to the reimbursement form and how to file it, and that is FCC Form 2100, Schedule 399. We call that the reimbursement form or Form 399, and it has multiple purposes um, and uh, multiple parts. It's used to establish that a station is eligible to participate in the program. It's used to submit estimates, and it's used to request reimbursement for incurred expenses. While we're going through the material, you should send in any questions that you have to us at the following email address. You'll see that up on the screen. It's reimbursementwebinar at FCC.gov. We aren't going to be taking questions orally. Um, there's too many people, I think, on the phone for that, but please send them in and we will um, uh, take a short break after the presentation and then resume for our panel to answer as many of your questions as we have time for. Please, though, keep in mind when you're submitting questions that we will not be able to resolve individual issues for stations in this forum. We won't be able to prejudge specific reimbursement requests either. So if you could try to focus your questions on universal points or programmatic requirements rather than on station-specific scenarios, we'll be able to um, answer as many of those as we can. So what brings us here today is the first ever incentive auction, which closed on April 13, 2017. The auction made spectrum avail available for mobile broadband and 5G services by repurposing 84 megahertz of television spectrum for wireless use. Clearing the spectrum required repacking of 987 full power and class A stations into a smaller TV band. Now that rebanding and repacking did displace some LPTV and translator stations, and those stations were given the opportunity to file for new channels in a special displacement window. Those stations may incur costs to move to their new displacement facilities. In addition, some FM stations that broadcast from or near the trans transmission facilities of repacked broadcast TV stations may also incur costs to minimize disruption of their radio service during the TV station's construction. At the time the transition began, we had some funds to reimburse full power and Class A television stations, but we did not have funds to reimburse the stations that are subject to today's webinar. In March 2018, Congress enacted the Reimbursement Expansion Act, and that provided us some additional funds and made the LPTV, translator, and FM stations eligible to receive reimbursement for the first time. In March of this year, uh, the Commission implemented rules in order to um, implement that uh, reimbursement program. LPTV and FM stations are going to be reimbursed following a process that's very similar to what we're using in our existing program for full power and Class A's already. That established program has already dispersed over $700 million. The expanded reimbursement form um, re received all the required approvals and be became uh, uh, available for your use for the first time on August 15th. And on that date, we also announced uh, the filing deadline for um, uh, this group of stations. And that filing deadline is October 
15th. So um, what, uh, let's talk about what steps uh, there are to uh, receive reimbursement. You'll need to get the reimbursement form submitted in LMS by that October 15th deadline. Now this includes submission in LMS of the item titled Form 399 Eligibility Form and the estimate section um, of the item titled Form 399 Broadcaster Relocation Reimbursement. You're going to see those uh, in a little while during this presentation. You should not wait to receive feedback on eligibility uh, before you submit Kevin your estimate. Bowers. has left the conference. We encourage that you not wait to submit the forms because we're going to be reviewing the materials as we receive them. Um, I'm going to give you uh, more detail about the eligibility requirements in a minute. Let's stick with process first. The reimbursement form is a dynamic form, and as you fill it out and go through it, um, it's going to guide users with prompts that indicate how and when you need to provide additional explanations or when you need to submit supporting documents. The stations will identify their existing equipment and the types of reimbursable costs that you expect to incur. Embedded in the form itself is a cost catalog that provides a list Cody, of the no. types of Have costs joined the conference. are most likely to incur, together with a range of prices applicable to those specific expenses. For cost estimates, entities can select the value from the cost catalog or they can provide their own estimate. The catalog is not an exhaustive list and additional types of expenses can be submitted. If costs have already been incurred when a station files its estimate, that station can submit their actual cost value as the estimate and you can provide the actual cost invoice at that time. After the staff completes, the commission staff completes the review of the eligibility forms and estimates that we received by that October 15th deadline, we're going to make an initial allocation from the fund. The allocation your station receives is the dollar amount you can draw down as you incur your expenses. The amount is going to depend on a number of factors, including the number of stations that file satisfactory eligibility certifications, the aggregate dollar value of the verified estimates after we've had an opportunity to review all of them, and the amount available for reimbursement for that category of stations. The available allocation your station receives will be viewable in the Commission's registration system in CORES, which I'm sure you all are familiar with. Um, there may be additional allocations that are made later in the program as we get additional information from stations. After the allocations are made, then we're ready to start dispersing funds. If a station submitted invoices at the estimate stage, then we'll be able to review those for reasonableness and assuming they're reasonable and eligible, we'll pay those invoices. If a station submitted estimates um, uh, by the October 15th deadline, then you'll later need to submit your invoices as you would incur your expenses. And that'll be done on the same Form 399 in LMS. Stations may receive requests from us called RFPs, requests for information about your submissions, and you'd get those via email. Please respond to them promptly because we will not be able to process an invoice until we've got a complete response. We make payments on a rolling basis, so get your invoices in when they're available and we'll be able to pay them. You don't need to wait until you have everything together uh, to start submitting for payment. When the station's project is finished, it will close out. Again, you're going to do that using the reimbursement form in LMS. You must submit a final Form 399 to notify the Commission that you have submitted all requests for reimbursement. A financial reconciliation statement will be created by us and we'll process that together with you and any remaining disbursements will be made. A final account closeout for each entity has to occur by the statutory deadline, which is July 3, 2023, and um, we'll be announcing more about that later in the program. One other item I want to mention that you'll also need to submit but is not a focus of this particular um, uh, webinar is the banking form. That's Form 1876. That's going to provide us with instructions on where we can direct your payments. That form is found in CORES in the Incentive Auction Financial Module. 
There's no deadline for filing that form, but you don't need to wait to submit it. You can file it at any time. You can start filing it now. I know we already have some. Um, you fill that out online and then print it, sign it, and notarize it, and send it to commission staff. And the staff will review it, and then they'll get back to you and tell you to uh, confirm your account information in court. You'll have 10 days to do that. There is a tutorial link on um, this presentation and also on our website that can give you more detailed information on how to fill out that form. So those are the overall steps through the entire reimbursement process. Now we're going to talk a little bit more about the um, eligibility requirements for LPTV. They're a little bit different for FM, so we're going to talk about them um, uh, after LPTV. LPTV and translator stations had to be operating for nine calendar months between April 12, 2016 and April 13, 2017 to be eligible for reimbursement. During those months, stations must have been transmitting for at least two hours each day, um, each day of the week, not less than a total of 28 hours per calendar week. An LPTV translator station has to have filed an application during the Commission's special displacement window, and it must have been granted in order for a station to be eligible. That window was between April 10 and June 1 of 2018. Stations who were displaced before the window who requested a waiver to file an STA to operate on a new channel, and we granted that, they'll be considered filed inside the window. Eligible costs do not include anything that the LPTV or translator station has been paid or expects to be paid by another entity. To document that a station meets the requirements for eligibility, you need the LMS number, um, the LMS file number for the granted displacement construction permit. The only reason you would be able to file without that number is if the station completed the construction already and has filed a license to cover, and then the station will need to state that. You'll also need evidence that the station was licensed and transmitting as required by our rules. The best types of documents to use as proof of transmission include program guides, master control automation system logs, transmission logs, programming and operating logs, and commercial logs. If those aren't available, some additional types of documents that could be provided include tower or facility rental and leasing agreements, broadcast agreements, and third-party affidavits. While we will consider any documentation that is evidence of operation, other items may require additional scrutiny and so are considered on a case-by-case -case basis. One example that we've cited before is electric bills. If a station wants to rely on that, at a minimum, they'll need to be sure the document is clearly tied to the station's location and that there's information in the document reflecting the entire period required for transmission. Please, guys, keep in mind that the Commission staff will not be able to create an eligibility record for you. The station has to file sufficient material. Um, a word about certifications, and this is applicable to both LPTV and FM translators, um, and FM stations, excuse me. We urge representatives to carefully read and consider the certifications required for submission of the reimbursement form, which applies to all statements and all documents submitted in support of a request for an eligibility finding and for reimbursement. False certifications are subject to criminal penalties. Certifications require that all statements and documents are true, complete, and correct. They constitute material representations to the Commission, and payments will be used only for approved, incurred expenses. So let's turn now to the FM eligibility requirements. To be eligible... Jim Belize ...has left the station, conference. A station must have been licensed and transmitting on April 13, 2017. The station must be operating on the same tower as a facility or on a tower in close, proxi prox close proximity to a facility that was impacted by the repack of a full power or Class A television station, and the repack must have caused the FM facility to incur costs to reasonably minimize disruption of service. The station must describe the reason it incurred cost. 
which could include one or more of the following. The station had to A, permanently relocate its main transmission site, B, temporarily dismantle all or some of the facility at its main transition site, and or C, construct or modify an interim auxiliary facility. Costs associated with interim facilities are only eligible for reimbursement if the station's primary or existing auxiliary facility would lose more than 20% of the station's normal covered population or more than 20% of its normal coverage area for more than 24 hours that's not limited to the hours of 12 a.m. to 5 a.m. local time. Again, eligible, eligible costs do not include anything the FM station has been paid or expects to be paid by another entity. The documentation that a station needs to meet the requirements for eligibility uh, require the FM station to provide the facility ID number of the full power or Class A station whose construction triggered the cost. For the interim or auxiliary facilities, the station must attach contour maps, dates, and times to evidence that the station meets the eligibility criteria. For, co uh, for contour maps, that includes um, maps showing at 60 and 70 DBU contours from the main transmission site for full power and reduced power transmission, including total area Has coverage joined the and total population covered based on Census Bureau population centroids. For the interim auxiliary facilities, we need maps for both full and reduced power and including total area and population. We also need you to identify all dates and times that the broadcast transmission at the main transmission site were or will be required to cease or to operate at reduced power and we'll also need all dates and times for operation of the new or the modified interim facility. Okay, that's a lot of information um, about uh, what the uh, policies are. Some of this begins to, I think, make more practical sense when you see how you feed the information into Form 399, and I'm going to turn this over to Jeff Newman to walk you through that form uh, so you can see it um, uh, in a more detailed way. Uh, not in the presentation. Turn has off. left the conference. So uh, good morning, everyone. Give us one second. I'm going to uh, mute you for one second while we uh, get the, the right slides. Well, hopefully everyone can see the correct thing on the screen now. So good morning. Uh, if folks are seeing the wrong thing, they can email the uh, the webinar email address and tell us that it has uh, all been gone wrong. So good morning, everyone. Our apologies. I hope everyone enjoyed a nice warm cup of coffee over the last two minutes. My name is Jeff Newman. I'm the chief engineer of the Media Bureau and uh, helping to put together this reimbursement program for all of our new entities. I want to show you uh, the LMS-based system for filing uh, your eligibility and reimbursement requests tell you a little bit of the nuances of getting those uh, requests in the door and um, help you to understand how the program uh, is going to work for folks. The first thing to know is that you'll need to uh, file through LMS as you do for other um, uh, license-related filings. And you need to file this against your active license. I know we talked about your active construction permit, but that comes later. So find the facility ID, find the active license that you are uh, planning to file against underneath the authorizations tab in LMS. Once you have pulled up your active license, you select um, one of the two forms that are available for, uh, one of the two parts of the Form 399 that we talked about before, the eligibility form first, and later the relocation reimbursement form. We'll start by walking through a couple parts of the eligibility form. The eligibility form, as well as the relocation form, look an awful lot like the other forms in LMS. They follow that familiar template at the top 
is a uh, header block discussing the facility ID that you're filing for, the service code, your call sign. Jenny you, Herman has you know, left the conference. Office. Step one is going to be to add a contact information to this form. We require a reimbursement contact for this program separate from the other contacts that might be listed on your LMS filings. This is a person we are going to reach out to with specific questions about this form um, or the uh, reimbursement process otherwise. It should be somebody familiar with the station's reimbursement and able to uh, discuss the... Dan Viles. ...has left the conference. Then we reach uh, the actual eligibility form. To document that a station meets the requirements for eligibility, you need the LMS file number of the granted uh, displacement construction permit. If you do not have that, because you have filed a license to cover over that construction Jeff permit, Taylor. thus making the construction permit uh, has inactive, left the conference. you can indicate so with the checkbox that is immediately underneath the, uh, that selection window. Then you need to make the relevant certifications. I am select whichever of the tick boxes are uh, relevant to your particular station's situation. Then upload your documentation the underneath the attachments link uh, up above. For FM stations, the process is the same until the screen we just looked at. The first difference is that each FM station must enter the facility ID of the impacting TV stations. There could be one or there can be more, many. Then select the appropriate certification questions from below. If the station will be off air or at reduced power um, to construct or modify interim has joined the conference. To construct or modify interim auxiliary facilities, you will need to indicate the dates and times that that off-air or reduced power will be occurring. And that will be done so dynamically, as Hillary said, if you select that particular certification box. Once you have certified out the eligibility form, you can return to your active license where we started this form from and select the broadcaster has joined the conference reimbursement option. Once you have that open, you will again see something that looks typical to other LMS forms. The Form 399 for reimbursement consists of three main sections. The applicant information, which will be pre-populated from your license, the transition plan, and the cost chart. Has left the conference. The applicant information and the transition plan are designed to be completed once, so you can revisit them if your information or your plan changes. The cost chart is designed to be visited every time. This is a form that will grow to contain your complete reimbursement picture. It isn't submitted once for one uh, receipt or invoice. It is submitted essentially complete every time, and we only look at the parts that have changed. You can jump straight to the cost chart from the navigation pane on the right side of the page. We will process your initial estimates in one big batch, then issue our initial allocation. As Hillary Henry said, Solomon. once Have that is done, the conference. revisions to estimates and all actual costs will be evaluated on a rolling basis, so there is no reason to wait to submit those costs. To complete the transition plan, and follow the guidance Has of left the, the conference. There are four main sections, one for your transmitter, one for an antenna, one for a transmission line, and one for a tower cost. Each of these um, types of equipment may either be reused, and the cost to allow that reuse is reimbursable, or replaced if appropriate. For each section, the existing equipment owned by the station and the equipment being purchased by the station and any other auxiliary costs or ancillary costs related to that equipment can be documented. The form will guide you through That's it. Griffin. Has joined this the conference. Gives our engineers a consistent basis to evaluate everyone's plan. There are sections at the end for professional services and other hard to categorize costs. Finally, we have catch-alls throughout the form that allow you to enter other costs not listed. 
in case nothing on the form accurately reflects the nature of your particular transition situation. The main section of the form, the part that you will visit each time you have an invoice to submit, is called the cost chart. The first time you visit the cost chart, you need to provide has joined the conference. To provide an estimate for a line item, just click the add next to the particular line, a transmitter, a the power, conference. an antenna, electrical service, whatever. If we have an entry from the cost catalog for that particular thing, it will appear in the column, in the leftmost column labeled the predetermined cost. Cody, no. At the bottom has of the page, the conference. The totals for the equipment displayed on this page and for the entire project. The cost chart is uh, split up over several pages just for readability. When no predetermined cost is available, and this is important, whatever you enter as your estimate will be copied into that column, and that allows the grand totals to make sense. Uh, lots of times folks will be purchasing things either at power levels or particular specifications uh, that were not specified in the catalog, or they'll be buying something else entirely. You must enter all the estimated costs in order to submit your form. You cannot submit a form with blank estimated costs. To add actual costs, to add, to add your actual invoices and receipts for reimbursement, you click Add under the Actual Cost column on the right side of the cost chart there. Then, to request reimbursement, you select Add Component. Upload or select an invoice or other documentation uh, that you've put into the system. You describe the invoice and describe the cost of being reimbursed. We call it a component because many things, especially transmitters or large things, are built in many parts. A deposit, another payment prior to shipping, the conference. final payment before installation or after installation. And all of these invoices are reimbursable when they are incurred, not when the project is finally completed. You can submit them after the project is finally completed, but there's no reason to wait. When you return for the second or third parts of a transmitter, for example, you come back to the same line item on the cost chart and add an additional component. At the end of the day, we will presumably see an estimate for an item and then actual costs, which look an awful lot like that. Once you're done, save and continue to return back to the cost chart. I'm going to revisit something that Hillary said on estimates. Estimates may be based on quotes. They can be based on the cost catalog, or they can be based on actual costs incurred. To utilize cost catalog prices as estimates, simply enter the value in the, uh, that's in the cost catalog column in the estimate column. You still have to click over and type it in. To utilize a quote for all or part of your station's estimate, enter in the value from your quotes, and then upload that quote in the attachments section of the form. You only need to upload Has the joined the conference. Or Has joined the conference. Or you don't have to do it every single time or over and over for each line item. To utilize actual costs incurred as all are part of an estimate, complete the actual cost like we just described on the previous side, then take whatever dollar amount that is and enter it in the estimates column. You still have to complete an estimates column so that uh, we can see the total cost for your project. But in that case, the invoices themselves serve as documentation for the estimate. To submit the form, continue through the certification screens. Just save and continue until it, asks, it gives you a summary, asks for your certifications. Remember, you must submit the form for us to review it. Submitting the form does not mean that you are done with it, that you've provided all of your costs. It means that you are ready to have us look at these things that you have entered this time. You will come back later to continue it. Uh, if you're not ready to submit, please feel free to save and quit, but until you submit, we won't see it. To resume an in-progress Form 399, again, this is something you're going to do each time you get an invoice, you need to find where you last left it. If the last thing you did was to save and quit the form, then it will be under your Applications tab under the Saved tab within there. If the last thing you did was submit it to the FCC for review, you will find it again under Applications under Submitted Applications. It will stay there until you file another Form 399. And with that, we've walked through the basics and, and then some of the Form 399.
Okay, so it looks like we've had a few questions come in on our um, email address already. Um, and I'd like to encourage you to continue to uh, send in questions to reimbursementwebinar at fcc.gov. Um, we're going to take just a couple of minutes break to allow you guys to do that and to um, uh, pull uh, the questions uh, for uh, response. Let's give it until uh, 11.45 and then we'll plan to jump back on the line in about 10 minutes and begin answering as many questions as possible. Five minutes. Five minutes. We'll give you folks about five minutes. We'll give you about five minutes. My watch is wrong. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, hi there. We are back. The conference. We have um, received a bunch of questions. We will not be able to get to all of them, um, I'm afraid, but we will um, uh, be putting up on our website a number of resources that will be useful uh, for you guys in answering your questions as you go. Uh, one of the questions we got is whether or not these slides would be um, available on the website. Yes, they will. Um, I uh, think it might take until the end of the week. We'll also have um, the recording of this webinar up on our website. We're also going to be posting, um, uh, hopefully today, uh, FAQs, uh, uh, frequently asked questions and answers, uh, one set for LPTV translators and one set for FM stations that will be available on our website. Our website also has a good deal of this information included already, um, and you can use that as a resource. So please um, look for those resources for anything we don't get to or that you need a reminder on. Um, one question we got is about um, uh, whether or not stations are eligible to reimburse employee time. Um, and the answer is um, generally uh, uh, yes, the answer is yes, we can reimburse for employee time, but there are going to be some uh, documentation requirements uh, regarding uh, specifically internal employee, internal labor time. Those uh, directions, those um, instructions on how to, how to do that are already included in the FAQs for the existing program, the full power and class A. Um, station program, and um, you can look at those for directions about what you need to file if you plan to be um, uh, uh, requesting reimbursement for those funds. I'm going to ask uh, Tom Nessinger to uh, address an FM station question next. Uh, thank you. And also, I'm, I'm here with Jim Bradshaw, who's Senior Deputy Chief in the Audio Division and also an engineer, which I am not. but. Uh, we have a question asking us to repeat the requirements for contour maps for FM stations. Uh, the, the person writing in asks if they only have a 60 dBU map because that's all required to obtain their license, do they need to get 70 dBU contour maps? And the answer is yes, we do want both. And just to explain a little bit why we want these, these contour maps, uh, there's certain coverage benchmarks that determine whether or not you're eligible for reimbursement. Uh, in our report and order, we said that you are eligible for reimbursement if, uh, for example, you had to reduce power from your main facility to the point where you would get, uh, you would not be able to achieve both 80% of your normal coverage population and 80% of your normal coverage area. Uh, so if you can't hit one of those under either of those two contours, then you would be eligible for reimbursement. Uh, likewise, we ask for those contours with regard to the interim facilities because, again, you, your interim facility has to achieve better coverage than you could with reduced power from Have your... Have joined the conference. So we want to see all those contours to see if you can, you know, hit that coverage benchmark in order Have to... Have joined the conference. See if you reimburse. And we're not going to uh, reimburse you for an interim facility if you're not going to do better from that than you could by just reducing power at your main facility. Now, obviously, if you're in a situation where you just have to shut down your main facility for some time, that becomes a little academic. Uh, and certainly, it's pretty easy to, to uh, do a 60 or 70 dBU contour when the power is zero. But uh, for those situations where people uh, might not have to actually shut down but, for example, maybe the work's being done on an adjacent tower and they could, you know, throttle back the power a little bit and still operate during repack work. We need to see that in order to determine whether or not you're eligible for reimbursement. Jim, maybe. Okay. okay. Jim, Jim is nodding, so he agrees with me. All right. Let me take a few, uh, a few questions that uh, go back into the process of all this as well. 
Uh, one question, some of our FM stations are not affected until later phases. This is, I'm sure, also true of some low power stations. The concern is that Anthony we Bird. have left the conference. Now, uh, and our costs will change okay. until the time we actually need to operate. Are we able to modify our the estimates conference. after October 15th? The answer to that question is yes. You may modify your estimates at any time in the program. The October 15th deadline will give us an opportunity to get our first best guess at the total cost to the program. We understand that some people's projects will go up, some people's projects will go down. We will make our allocation based on that. But as time goes on and as funds are available, we will adjust the amount of allocation available to individual stations and possibly to all stations in total. Let me follow on to Our that. Participant that has joined the conference. Issue. Another question that we have is about an FM station um, and if the work is still being done by the TV station at the deadline, what should they do at the October 15th deadline? What should they do? Um, in terms of filing estimates. You still need to meet that October 15th um, uh, filing date. Uh, you may rely on the cost catalog for your uh, uh, estimated costs for the work there. You will be able to change those as Jeff just identified um, during the course of the program if necessary. If you uh, use any estimate um, when you uh, file at that time, um, that is not from the cost catalog. You're going to need, though, to include a vendor quote, so you can't just make up another number. It either needs to be the cost catalog or it needs to be based on some, uh, you know, documented reality, a vendor quote. For a station that has completed their build, will they be able to file an eligible, will they still be required to file an eligibility form and then file a second form with the actual costs or can it all be done in one filing? The two sections still have to be filled out. You still have to establish your eligibility even if you're done uh, incurring costs. But then you are able to file all of your incurred costs and your estimates all at once. Feel free to put the whole shot in the system. Has this left then, the conference. Uh, I think flows nicely into the next question in my uh, pile here. It says, do you have an estimated turnaround time for reimbursements after the initial submission of invoices? Well, there are two phases to this program that we should talk about. There is the phase we are in right now where we are setting everything up for the first time and we have our initial estimates window. Invoices which are submitted now cannot be paid until after everyone has their initial allocation. That will happen after we review all of the estimates submitted and that won't happen until sometime after the October 15th deadline. So there's a, unfortunately going to be a wait until estimate, or until costs that are currently incurred are paid. However, after that point, we pay uh, invoices submitted on a rolling basis, and our turnaround is actually fairly quick. It's usually a matter of a couple of weeks uh, from the time an invoice is submitted until the time it is paid out. That could grow or shrink depending on the demand of the program, number of invoices submitted at any given time. Um, we got a question about whether LPTV stations um, uh, that complete their construction and are then later affected again by a change to a full power the or class A station um, uh, doing some additional construction are permitted to amend their uh, reimbursement requests and um, get reimbursement for that too. And uh, the answer there is going to be no. The only uh, reimbursable uh, expenses, the only eligible expenses under the statute are those that are related directly to the repack um, and not anything that has to do with additional changes that um, primary stations might make that affect the low power or translators operations. Um, our, uh, our rules don't permit us to reimburse any changes other than those directly uh, flowing from the facilities that are built in, um, in conformance with what was granted in the special displacement application. All right, three more process questions. Um, if you have, I've already submitted the form and certified to receive reimbursement, but they've seen no changes. That's right, it's going to take a while at this point until well after the October 15th deadline before you will see any, any change from submitted invoices to process paid or rejected. Is it possible that stations in the same category will receive different allocations? For instance, could one LPTV station be allotted more or less funds than another? The answer to that question is could they? Yes. Uh, we have not determined the exact method of allocation that we are going to use for low powers. We will take a look at what the data looks like as people submit their estimates and make a determination Charles then. Daniels. In the full the power program, we reimbursed all stations, a, or we allocated to all stations a percentage of their 
estimated costs or their verified estimated costs or reviewed estimated costs. Um, so if you estimated that your station, if we agreed that your estimate of $50,000 for your station was correct, you would receive a certain percentage of that. If another station estimated $100,000, they would receive that same percentage of the larger number, thus two different allocations. For reinvoice, reimbursement invoices require, um, requiring facility ID numbers, does the ID number have to be specified from the invoice producer or equipment manager, or can it simply be written on the invoice? Uh, yes, you can write your facility ID or your call letters on your invoice, and that is acceptable. Uh, however, we do need to be able to identify the station that an invoice goes with. Uh, we also got a question from an LPTV station about the timing of their incurred expenses, identifying costs that they've incurred already uh, and uh, prior to uh, the filing deadline, um, asking if there is um, any implication of the timing on the eligibility. And the answer to that is no, uh, so long as the cost is uh, incurred as a result of the repack and um, in uh, support of uh, constructing the facility uh, granted in the special displacement window, it would be uh, eligible regardless of whether it has already been incurred or uh, will be incurred. The next question on my side is how are upgrades handled? For example, if a station purchases a transmitter that was larger than the previous unit, or if the state new station's new, stations, stations new antenna, I'm sorry, is an elliptical antenna versus horizontal polarization only. Elliptical polarization is, of course, an upgrade uh, over your existing equipment. We would consider it an upgrade. In that circumstance, uh, we ask for a vendor quote or some guidance for what the like replacement would have been, so what an H-pole would have cost from the same vendor at the same power level. level. That then becomes the reimbursable amount of that antenna, so the station is responsible for the cost attributable to the upgrade. Um, has left the conference. question here, uh, please provide the path for locating filed Form 399s. Inside LMS, click on Applications, click on your Submitted tab, and it should be Filed. Right has left the conference. There. Uh, the filing type is Form 399. Hussein is going to address a question we have on the filings for LPTV that are eligible. A participant has left the conference. We have uh, received one question, and the question is, uh, will displacement applications for translators that will fall after the last window freeze be eligible in the future? Uh, and the answer to that is no. Uh, the reimbursement and all the stuff that we're doing right now, it has to do with the application that were granted during the special displacement window. So the question to this is no. Uh, I know we lifted the freeze for displacement application and started accepting application after, I think, beginning of April 18, if I'm not mistaken. And those, app, those displacement applications, they're not eligible for the reverse. Can you remind them when the displacement application window was? Uh, uh, it was. A displacement application window was uh, from April 10th through June 1st of 2018. So those are the ones that are eligible. All right, I have a couple more here. Um, again, a different version of the upgrades question. Can you please and review and uh, you should document a case of the conference. using upgraded equipment yeah, uh, of a size larger than like for like for their displacement or purchasing equipment to support elliptical when it was previously horizontal only? Will it be the same as it was in the full power class the conference. program? The answer to that question is yes. Has left uh, the conference. The same policies as we did for full power and class A's, if you are familiar with that. Um, we also permitted in Class A that the purchase of a transmitter one step larger than that strictly required uh, to service your um, power level is permissible. Um, there is other guidance in the FAQs on upgrades. Um, I'll just I'll just remind yeah. I'll just remind um, uh, in following on to that and this gets into uh, a, a po the policy that has been set by the commission in the report and order for LPTVs. Um, uh, the 
the low power uh, translator stations are permitted to build the facility that they uh, were granted in the special displacement window. Sometimes that requires a change in location as well as a change in channel. The upgrade limitation for full power and class A was a little bit different because it had um, uh, uh, a channel change only. Um, and so Joe we don't you. have all of the same uh, issues to consider. Um, but we, as a general rule, are not funding upgrades, but we will fund a change in uh, location or facility that's been granted under that special displacement Shelby window. Shelby Sadowski has different. left the conference. That's a, yeah, that's an important point that, the, that these programs, while they are going to be run under very, very similar policies, cannot be exactly the same. Some uh, of my LPTV clients have, some clients have asked this particular council to submit their request for reimbursement and whether uh, those services would be reimbursable. And the answer to that question is yes, uh, legal services uh, in conjunction with the program are reimbursable. We also have a question. Um, I I'm not sure if I'm eligible to uh, submit as an LPTV station for reimbursement funds uh, based on the eligibility requirements. Can I submit my eligibility uh, form and uh, see if it's acceptable? And the answer to that is no, I'm afraid you cannot. Um, we, uh, as I uh, pointed out during the uh, presentation, we um, have certifications that require um, a good faith assertions that you meet the eligibility requirements and you shouldn't, nobody should be, you know, throwing the needle up against the wall, see if it sticks. It's, um, you've got to be able to uh, fully certify to the uh, truth of uh, each of those um, uh, cer certification Has requirements joined the conference. in order to put something in. And, and I think we're running up to the last question here. When has left the conference. Will there be an update to the reimbursement frequently asked questions yes. to address low I powers? actually just said that. They will, we are going to include John Allen. Um, uh, has left FAQ the conference. FM, our participant FAQ has left the LPT conference. Translators on our website uh, very soon. Brian today, has um, left the conference. Uh, I hope, um, or in very short order. We are also in the process of updating. We constantly update our full power and class A. So Lawrence Loesch has left the conference. We have other um, stations. You can look for updates um, on those as well. Um, I want to just our participant to has to, left the conference. Uh, our um, web page, our website, where we have a lot of resources available to support you uh, in going through this process. Uh, we've gotten um, uh, some has questions. left the conference. Station specific um, over the last um, a few minutes here. Uh, and we are not able to address those very station-specific um, items in this forum, but we're very happy to talk to you about questions that you have about your... A participant actual, has um, left the conference. ...and your specific document. Um, you'll see both an email address and a phone number on the screen now, um, and that's also uh, easy to find on has our left website. the conference. So ...that we can talk to you about any uh, remaining specific questions that you have. So um, thank you very much for participating in this webinar and for your interest in the program. We really look forward to um, <coughs> and um, accepting all your has left the conference over 15th. Um, thanks so much. 